Chapter 2 I Will The next day, Zania sent Horion to the lake to catch a stock of fish for her and Rosalina to cure for winter. Of all the chores he had been asked to do, Orion was more than happy to oblige this one, for he loved spending time outdoors. He had seen much since he had been away, but no land could rival the rugged resplendence of Dicentia. The colours found there in the flowers and trees, in the decoration of the plentiful island creatures, seemed to exist nowhere else and almost as much as he'd missed his family, he had missed the countryside of his homeland, especially on the dawn of a new day. So, early that morning, Orion had climbed into a wooden rowing boat, and was now sitting in the half-light of a newly breaking dawn. He had fished this lake many times as a boy. He turned to look at the land behind him, not needing the illuminating daylight to discern the thatched cottages of his village. To alleviate his homesickness, when he first left Dicentia, he would close his eyes and map each cottage and each face in his mind, each craftsman, each friend. This place was his heart, and its people were his soul, for he and its people were his soul, for he and his friends grew up together as they played with the soil and ran along this lake, the river, the mountains, animals and trees, and the unchanged glory of these surroundings had brought Orion a tremendous sense of peace upon his return. With a large, strong hand, he dug into the moist dirt from the bait-bucket and brought it to his nose. He breathed deeply, inhaling the familiar scent of the soil, the scent of his home. During his four years away, Orion had often imagined himself in this very spot, fishing as he used to. He had been a wide-eyed twelve-year-old boy when he left the island of Kirachu. As was the purpose of his absence, he had returned a man— strengthened from his years of combat training, and bronzed from his time spent as an apprentice on a ship, studying the ways of the world. The Dissentians were a race of people much like humans in appearance. Their bodies, however, tended much more to physical perfection. Descended from giants, each Dissentian grew to an average height of twelve feet, give or take an inch or two. Orion had reached a mere six and a half feet when he left his island home, but by his fifteenth birthday had shot up to his full height of twelve feet and one inch. His one slight frame had not just grown taller. It had now filled out with sinewy muscle like his father's. Orion's complexion was smooth and fair like his mother's, but his face was by no means womanly. It was the tradition of Dicentian boys to wear their hair short, but now Orion's brown, honey-streaked hair hung down, flatteringly framing his chiselled cheeks. He was, by all accounts, a very handsome young man, a gentle giant, sure to be the object of much female attention. It was inevitable that he would one day bring home the fine daughter-in-law his mother hoped for. Still, in truth, Orion had not been around women enough for them to occupy much space in his mind. The only ones he thought of were the ones he had been separated from. He had missed his family terribly while away. He dreamed of them nightly, longing for the day when he would be with them again. He had hoped that Marlon and his father would have gone fishing with him, but Marlon was still fast asleep when he left, and Juratan had work of his own to attend to. Despite the weariness of his journey, Orion had barely been able to sleep the night before. More than anything else, he had been kept awake with thoughts of the Dicentian blade. Although Orion had been disappointed that his father and brother had not accompanied him, he was gratified to find that his luck with the fish remained the same. In short order, he had filled a large basketful, 
doing all he could to shore up the family's food supply before the fish found protection from his hook through several inches of solid ice. Arthur, his squirrel, was not nearly as fond of being in the small boat as was Orion. <sighs> Do you not think you have caught enough fish already, Orion? Arthur asked, yawning. Enough, Orion retorted, looking at the red rodent. Pardon me for being so industrious, but we have to survive the whole of the winter on these fish, he said, as he threaded a large spider onto the hook of his rod and heaved it into the water to attract yet more bounty. When you were looking up at me with those beady little eyes of yours, begging me to fill your empty belly, I will remember how supportive you were of this venture, my squirrel friend. Arthur lowered his head and muttered silently to himself. The squirrel had been a gift to Orion when he left Dysentia to first begin his training. The creature, instilled with the magic of speech, was to keep the boy company during his time away from home. When Orion was still a boy, the idea of a talking squirrel seemed less silly than it did now. Still, he could not imagine himself without Arthur. Although the squirrel sometimes annoyed him with his laziness and back-talk, he had proven himself an excellent companion. Indeed, after all this time, Orion hardly noticed that Arthur was anything other than his constant companion, except, that is, when he caught himself conversing with him in front of others. What's more, when others were present, Arthur grew dumb. After all, a red talking squirrel would fetch a high price on the open market, and Orion did not want to risk the theft of his good little friend. Many minutes passed without any bites on the end of Orion's fishing rod. The sun was rising wide over the calm lake. He had been out for two hours already, taking advantage of the fact that fishing is most fruitful just before daybreak, when the world is dark and quiet and it is more difficult for the fish to figure out that they are being tricked. Weary from the hour and their task, Orion and Arthur were nodding off, when the sudden creaky sound of the rod's reel alerted them. Brace yourself, Orion cried out, the arched rod held tightly in one hand and managing the reel with the other. This is a big one. Over the minutes that followed, Orion played the fish with the artistry of a skilled fisherman bringing his catch in. When the fish was finally in the boat, both could see that the glittering silver prize was the length of his arm. A Sisingra fish, he told Arthur. He will feed us well, that is, if I can get him off the hook. The sun had now risen fully above the lake, its bright light dancing on the small ripples of the crystal blue water the glare making it harder to see what lay beneath. The best time for fishing had passed. It was time to head home. Orion looked at Arthur, about to let him know that his wish was about to be granted, and just when he was about to do this deed, a piercing scream cut him off. It was a man's scream, so shrill that stags and deer came bursting out of the wood as the sound rang through the forest and echoed off the lake. A scream of that pitch and of that volume at that hour would have filled anyone's heart with fear. It was no different for Orion, as he looked at Arthur, whose small eyes widened. The Sasingra fish had been putting up an honourable fight as Orion struggled to free its long, slippery form from the end of the rod. The prey took advantage of his distraction and gave its predator one last hard slap with its tail, before skittering over the edge of the boat and back into the depths of the lake. Under normal circumstances, Orion would have been mightily distressed to have lost such a catch, but right then he paid the fish no mind, and instead focused his gaze on the trees lining the lake. The morning sky was filling with the island's many bird species, their multicoloured wings in frantic motion as they hurried away from the spot where Orion's family cottage stood. Orion steeled himself, trying to be brave, but his soul quaked. He had never heard his father scream before, but in his heart 
He knew that was exactly what that horrible shriek was. His father screaming. He grabbed the boat's paddles and drove the boat towards the shore where he had left his father's trusty steed, Tempest, tethered to a tree. The horse was well trained and remained calm in the face of the commotion. Arthur scurried onto Orion's shoulder just as the young man swung onto the saddle before giving Tempest a firm kick. Neighing and rearing onto its hind legs, the beast shot off into the forest with great speed. A short ride from the lake to the cottage was the longest of Orion's life, as so many questions clawed his mind. Almost there, his thoughts were interrupted by a man's shout. What the hell? The voice, which Orion could not place, sounded very displeased. Dragging the reins, he skidded Tempest to a stop just out of earshot. He then dismounted and hid behind a tree. Peeping around the side of the thick trunk, he surveyed the scene. The man spoke again, just as loudly and just as angrily. Tell me, you son of a slug, what is this blade made of? Juratan, not easily cowed, snapped back. You tell me how you found out about it. Don't play with my patience, or I'll bite your head off. Now answer me. What is this blade made of? Stunned, Orion realized that this could be none other than King Galaroth, and when he saw that his father's left hand had been amputated by some sort of weapon, the colors of his world just seemed to have lost their luster. He remained watchful, utterly usurped by a terror so complete that he could taste it. He had never seen Galaroth but there was no one else it could be. The Galerians were also descended from a race of giants, before undersea earthquakes cleaved the continents, and volcanic ash gave birth to distinct island worlds. Most two-legged beings were more alike than they were dissimilar. However, while the Dissentians' beauty had evolved to match that of their home, the Galerians' appearance, which did not seem terribly evolved at all, matched the crudeness of theirs. Long, sharp horns protruded from their large skulls, and their complexions were deathly white. King Galaroth was almost ghostly white, and his horns grew back from his head, marking his royal bloodline. The horns of common Galerians curled in the direction of their sunken white cheekbones. Still, this beastliness could be strangely attractive, perhaps because of the power that went along with it. The way one is captivated by sharks, not because their looks are handsome, but because those attributes grant them such a high position on the food chain. King Galaroth bore his thirteen-and-a-half-foot frame with great nobility, exuding an air of command, as was his birthright. Even as he shouted at Orion's father, he had Zania's cheeks clasped firmly in one enormous gloved hand, so tightly that blood was drawn from her pale lips. Seeing his mother in such peril made Orion feel as though his heart had stopped. "'How did you find out about the blade?' Juratan demanded. Even in his vulnerable position, his inherent nobility was obvious. Instead of replying, Galaroth suddenly released Orion's mother and bent towards the ground. Only then did Orion note the hilt of a weapon— sticking out of the top of his father's familiar leather satchel. The king gripped the hilt. What the filth is this? It weighs more than a whale. Screwing his boots into the soft soil, he interlocked both hands on the hilt. Struggling, he swung the Dissentian blade free of its covering. Orion's eyes expanded when he saw King Galaroth's hands begin to glow with a ruddy light, a light so bright that the Dissentian blade blurred into the surrounding light of the morning, <laughs> cried the ominous overlord. You little leech! 
What cursed sorcery is this? The light grew in intensity, and wisps of grey smoke began to emerge from between his hands. Orion watched in wonder as the Dissentian blade started to fade, a mist creeping down its length. Suddenly the metal appeared to vaporise, and Galaroth gave a harsh scream. <coughs> the Dissentian blade had vanished in a veil of smoke leaving the villain with something far more valuable than the blade itself. The Nine Elements. Blinking like an owl blinded in the sunlight, Galaroth looked at the precious stones, and then gripped Zania's face once more. What in blood's name just happened? And what are these stones? Answer me! and restore the bloody blade this stinking instance, you son of a skunk, he demanded, squeezing even harder, or I will crush the head of your bitch like a grape. Bitch. The sight of his mother being tormented on her knees like an animal, combined with his father's injury, overwhelmed Orion with an emotion he had never felt in his life. Glaring with eyes that could gobble Galaroth alive, he was unable to control his trembling chin and the tear that rolled down his otherwise stoic face. His fright flared into rage, roaring through his veins. His blood boiled like lava and throbbed through his neck. Pounding behind his ear, a brusque hatred choked him as he found himself running to a nearby tree that had an axe protruding from its trunk. Still unseen, Arthur hissed desperately into Orion's ear. Don't do this! It is folly! You will be killed! Faster than the flap of a bee's wing beat! Good counsel indeed, but unheeded. You stand no chance! No chance at all! Do you really believe that this axe will protect you against Galaroth? Deep down, Orion did not want to be dissuaded as he endeavoured to pull the large heavy axe, which was meant to be used by two men simultaneously. Like the axe, the tree itself was huge. Everything in Orion's land was large, the plants and mushrooms, the animals and insects, even the boulders, in keeping with the needs of its residents. If a person ever had cause to wonder why there would be a tree as ludicrously tall and big around as a jadad on the earth, the answer may very well be, because that forest was once home to individuals who required such trees for safety and shelter. On this day, though, the tree in Orion's forest was behaving much more like a hindrance than a help, refusing to release the axe from its thick bark. Finally, after much effort, the axe broke free in Orion's hands, its blade falling heavily to the ground. Orion struggled to toss it over his shoulder. Arthur shook his head in disapproval. See how you struggle? You can barely carry that axe, let alone swing it. Do not be dim-witted. Galaroth is not going to leave this world as easily as he can take you out of it. And you know in your heart you can't take him on, Orion. Oh, listen to me. A strong man isn't the one who can wrestle another. But a strong man is the one who can wrestle his anger, so please! Arthur's words somehow pierced Orion's hurt, fear and anger. He paused and bowed his sweat-drenched head. Slowly he released the axe's handle from his grip. Not only Arthur's words, but his training too came to mind. He had been trained to be courageous, but careful to attack smartly when prepared. It was not easy, but he managed to allow the wisdom of those teachings to take control. You are right, my loyal and shrewd friend, you are right. He sighed, bending over and resting his hands on his knees. Already they were blistering from his struggle with the axe. It was hard, but Orion had to accept that he was not yet ready for this level of confrontation. Fortunately, his actions had gone unnoticed by the single-minded Galaroth. 
the malevolent monarch was still menacing Horion's parents. What deep thought are you in, Juratan? The grip I have on your lovely wife is getting tighter. I am sure she would scream if she could. No, please wait, Juratan cried out. I will tell you what you need to know. Galaroth smiled, convinced his adversary was weakening. In doing so, he underestimated Juratan as a magic staff manifested itself in his remaining hand. He used it to cast a spell that brought the tree behind the brute to life. Before Galaroth could react, the tree grabbed him with its branches, wrapping him around and constricting him like hundreds of boas. As soon as Galaroth's grip on her face loosened, Zarnia took refuge behind a well as her husband pointed his staff and fired a blue blaze at his oppressor. To Juratan's dismay, Galaroth had used his own magic to break free from the tree's tight embrace, and quickly cocooned himself with his crimson cape. <laughs> so, you want to fight fire with fire. Very well. It is time to see whose magic is greater. The fiend fired a red bolt of energy at Juratan, who immediately parried it with a blue one of his own. My fire was born to blow. Now cinder already, you slug. Galaroth snarled, his red bolt overpowering the injured wizard. In an horrific instant, the red energy turned into a huge, singeing snake, which tore Juratan's head apart. The sparks fizzing fiercely into the air were so intense that they silenced Joratan's death scream. Watching powerlessly, as his father was burned alive, Orion felt as if the sky came crashing down to earth and the forest floor shifting beneath his feet, plunging him into the lightless lair of agony's abyss. As he looked on, he saw Joratan's left eye dangling free held in place by the optic nerve, as his brain bubbled and boiled. Juratan held his eye in his hands, and he screamed. <laughs> Juratan screamed a scream that would surely have made the stones cover their ears, if they had any. Rage, agony, fear, hurt, grief. These five foul feelings filled Orion with a blackness so vile that anyone's shadow would flee upon seeing it. Even the darkness of his despair, however, did not save him from seeing the end of his father's terrible pain. Blood bubbled and burbled from the open crown of his skull. His face, or what remained of it, looked like that of a rotten apple. All is lost. All is smithereens. Orion slurred, before sinking his teeth into his forearm to forestall a scream that would betray his presence. He was not the only one who rued the terrible deed of his father's death. The wicked wizard, too, had overplayed his hand. No! What have I done in my fury? Galaroth clapped his hands, and the sheer shockwave extinguished the blaze, preventing it from spreading. Galaroth flew to his fallen foe, and after squashing the snake, he kicked it away. Seeing Galaroth occupied, Zarnia bolted from her hiding place for the forest. She moved quickly, but not quickly enough. <laughs> And where do you think you're going, gorgeous? Galaroth sneered, his lips gnarling a fearful grin. He aimed a fist in her direction and used his mental might to pull her back. Zania cried as she clawed at the grass, fighting desperately to stay away from her husband's killer. Let me go, please. My children will be orphans. She beseeched with all her heart. Hearing the horror, fused with hatred in her voice, a lump formed in Orion's throat, 
He stretched his right arm forward, his fist clasping the empty air. He was so close to his mother, and yet, yet he might as well have been on the other side of the ocean. As she was dragged further away, his closed fist slowly unclenched. His heart ached, remembering the last time he had held her hand. His hand touched his cheek, where she at last touched his face. Galaroth brought Zania to him, and like a shameless thief raised her to her knees. He then pulled her hair and said, Look, you little bitch, look at what happens when you wage war with a wicked, wizardly warrior king like me. Now, kiss the consequence. Aiming his other fist at the remnants of Juratan, Galaroth unsheathed his own blade, known throughout all the lands as the Monarch's Machete. Orion's hatred for Galaroth grew even more when he found himself marvelling at this machete that was going to guillotine his father's head. Seven and a half feet long it was, with a full tang, scale grips, a vestigial cross-guard, and a broad, flat blade that widened and was scalloped near the end, a shape reminiscent of a dragon wing. Orion and his mother held their breath as Galaroth gently tapped the back of what remained of Juratan's neck. The wicked wizard then raised the blade as though it was a trophy, and then down it came, and off went Joratan's head, rolling away like fallen fruit. Galaroth paid it no mind as he flayed the dead man's flesh. Joratan's internal organs oozed upwards, moving in a viscous mass, filling the satchel that the wizard had made of the dead man's flesh. Even as this horrible thing was taking place, Galaroth reached for a bottle on his battle belt. He uncorked the cylindrical canister and poured out a dark green liquid, stirring both his hands over the concoction like a mad mage, speaking words Orion did not understand. Savutare, Mary, Yan, Su, Mary, Hum, Shukul, I. He chanted these strange words over and over. His formerly glittering ice blue eyes were now a smouldering red. If you would not explain the blade to me in life, you will do so in death. You scum. Now, reveal the secret. Do you want to know how I found out about the blade? <laughs> it was only a revolting rumour, a whisper in the waves until today. It was the sheer energy radiating from the blade, Juratan. <laughs> you must have been a fool to think that with all my mental might I could not send such, such power. <laughs> now, tell me its secrets. Galaroth repeated the chant ten times over, and then he gave up. <laughs> In vain. A waste of good black magic and my precious breath. He gives up nothing, even in the permanent defeat of death. Galaroth shook his head until something new captured his attention. Marlon had just woken up and was rubbing his eyes, unaware of the significance of the scene before him. <laughs> Who's this? Marlon, run! Zania shrieked, but too late. A 
as her sun was already in the orbit of Galaroth's gravity. With a sneer, Galaroth turned his attention back to Zania. <laughs> I suppose this means that you and your swine of a son will be coming with me. <laughs> His smile was even more horrible than his grimace. You are far too winsome to live a widow's life, and I do believe you know something about that infernal blade, but, mind you, if I am not able to choke the truth out of you, you will not be lucky because you live. Oh, no, my lovely... You will be lucky if I allow you to die. Galaroth growled these words, with his face pressed close to Zanias. <laughs> he followed his edict with the senseless laugh of a crazy drunkard, which made Orion's toes curl in his boots as the coldest shiver shattered down his spine. A moment later, Galaroth had thrown Zania over his shoulder and had tucked a squirming Marlon in the crook of his powerful arm. Both mother and son screamed and beat him on the back with their fists. They might as well have been fleas on the back of a rhinoceros. Galaroth gestured, and a cage materialized before him. With a rough thrust, he shoved Orion's mother and brother inside. Of its own accord, a Maltrosian swooped down through the canopy of trees, its expansive wings taking down branches and leaves as it made its way to its master. Galaroth glided onto the three-headed white dragon that jumped, and then, with a single lazy flap of its awesome wings, the Maltrosian was in the air again, grasping the cage that held Orion's mother and brother in its topaz talons. Asphyxiated by abject agony, Orion screamed, No! Finally able to give a sound to his pain. In that moment fear fled from his face. His bones felt as if they would leap from his body. No longer interested in stealth, he lunged forward, jumping over a toppled tree, barging boughs, tackling tree stumps and thorns, skipping over the stones, protruding roots, and camouflaged crevices. Like a wild, deranged, dissentient bull, Orion burst from the forest directly under the path of the dragon's flight, the din of Galaroth's laughter still ringing the drums of his ears made all sound die away. So filled was he with rage that his field of vision shrank to a narrow tunnel before him. There he could see the cage, which made him foolishly fuel a new valour with the thought that whatever happens, happens. Also that one can run from fate but never hide, and that whatever is inscribed in one's destiny cannot be changed, save by the decider of destiny himself. Knifing the air with his hands, and pushed on by an otherworldly wind, at the least he would touch his lips to his dear mother's forehead one last time. His breath was ragged as he huffed and puffed and pushed his legs to the limit, but he slipped. He fell to the forest floor as his hopes and dreams flew away. He had spent his youth in that forest and could expertly navigate every inch of it, even in the dark so it took him by complete surprise when he found himself falling, having slipped on something unexpected. And gelatinous. What is this go? He cursed, as he found himself lying on his back. He was at the very edge of the forest, an area he had not visited since his return to the island, when he realized what had caused his misstep. He felt his blood go cold. Next to him, Illuminated by the sun's light, lay a heart, entrails, lungs, and one emerald green eyeball that resembled his own, his father's eye. 
From a branch they lay leeching out of a sack that looked like the one Galaroth had been chanting over. Seeing the guts of his father, convinced Horion that he was still cloaked by that cloud, the cruel cloud that thundered, Lord Trinigan Apocalypse doesn't exist, son. If Trinigan did exist, would he ever have allowed you to see such a dark day? Such a cruel message, yet it seemed to provide a poisonous proof to Horion that even if anything divine did exist, it was no better than the tyrants who dictate their dominions. So much for the portending stings, and a rank greater than emperorship, he thought bitterly, as he realized that Galaroth had been using his father's remains to try to summon Juratan's spirit, to get him to reveal the secrets of the Dacentian blade. He had underestimated what a worthy warlock and adversary Juratan was, and had made the prideful mistake of misjudging his opponent's own foresight and influence. Even in his grief, Orion felt a huge surge of pride for his father. That positive feeling lasted but a fleeting moment, though, before it was swept away by an even larger wave of woe. He picked up the heart that Galaroth had cast aside with such disdain. Tenderly he washed it with the tears of his eyes that flowed from the flood of an inconceivable sorrow, and then he brought his lips to them in a devotional kiss. It was his father's heart which had been ripped out, but holding it in his hands, Orion could swear his own heart was being wrenched from his chest. Over and over again, and then chewed on by Galaroth, like cattle maul hay. Is this my destiny? he cried out, in a voice so loud that it broke, that since the time of my birth I was destined to be an orphan, a bloody orphan. Tears that did not come suddenly could not be stopped. I am so, so, so sorry, he cried to his father, but without being able to form the word, father, the lump in his throat clogged any possibility of that word being uttered. He looked up to see that the dragon was long gone, just a speck in the sky, so small anyone would have mistaken the Maltrosian for a bird. He scowled at the fading fiend as he waved the black flag of immortal hatred for Galaroth in his heart. She is gone. They are gone. My mother, my father, my little brother, my, my best friends. My everything is gone. What do I do now? He said in a whimpering whisper, gently cradling his father's heart in his trembling hands. That night, at dusk, Orion built a ceremonial funeral pyre on the beach, placing his father's remains with grace and honor upon it. He could not fathom the hours that had gone by on that terrible day could not measure when he'd revealed the news of his father's death to his grandmother, not with words, but with eyes cracked by sorrow and pure pain. Rosalina had screamed then, screamed in such a manner that Gale was awoken from her sleep, as well as alarming the entire village. They all came running. Now they wept and gnashed their teeth on the beach, waiting as Orion prepared to perform a man's task, the duty of the first-born son, and now the only son. Rosalina had tried to keep Gale away from such a sight. Her granddaughter, as yet, had not shed a single tear. She was standing beside her grandmother in silence, strangely and calmly stroking the hair of her doll. Rosalina knew how deeply Gale loved Juratan and she could not even begin to conceive the effects 
Duritan's demise would have on the child's young and fresh mind. It was an impossible task to keep her at bay. But it was indecent, she thought, to even try and keep her from witnessing the last rites of her father, no matter how young she was. Rosalina and the entire village cried and bayed when they saw Orion step out of the now frightening forest with a large seashell, the very one Zania had always used to carry water with. Now it was overflowing with oil. With tears overflowing from his eyes, Orion stopped and looked down at his little sister. Gale did not so much as flinch, wordlessly. He acknowledged her presence. Then he continued, and standing before his father's funeral pyre, dipped his fingers into the shell. He looked back at Rosalina, who nodded her head solemnly. Orion flicked the oil liberally over the pyre. He sprinkled the incense, and then went toward Rosalina to take the torch from her. Raising it in his hand, he heard something, a splattering sound. Looking back, he was aghast to see Gale pouring the rest of the shell's contents over herself. Gale! In a voice ghostly calm, she said, Orion, if you burn my father, then you will also have to burn me. Gale, please do not do this. We have lost our love, Joritan, our love, Marlon, and my dear daughter-in-law, Zania. We do not want to lose you, too. Rosalina begged. Grandmother, understand I cannot live without father. I love him too much. I want to go to him. I want to be with him forever. She turned to Orion. Burn me, Orion, please. Burn me. Oh, Gail. Father always said you would grow up to be someone significant, a healer or a sorceress. Will you not fulfil his dreams? Surely you will not let them go up in flames. Orion, please understand, and do not try to bribe me with father's hopes. Orion was not sure what to do. Gail, please, move out of the way. The auspicious time is fleeting. No! Gail cried out, shielding the pyre with her body. Gail, what foolishness is this? You understand? Please understand that we will not be able to live without you. It is a selfish act you contemplate. Think of Mother and Marlon, who still breathe and live. Think of the rest of us. We are still alive, and we need you to live. I will bring Mother and Marlon back, I promise. I swear it, on my own life. I swear on Mother's well-being. I swear, I, I... I swear on the sun that I will bring them back. So please, just live to see that day. Orion sank to his knees, pressing his hands to his face in a prayerful pose. A moment later his hands were drawn from his face, and he found himself looking into the caring eyes of his sister. She wiped away his tears. Even as her own began to roll down her cheeks, Orion wrapped his arms around her, saying, Yes, cry, Gail. Let it out. Great sobs suddenly erupted from her, with tears filling her eyes. Orion glared up at the star-studded sky, thinking that the gods are so cruel and have no love or mercy for man whatsoever. Gale's tears slowed, finally sobbing softly to a stop. With a shuddering sigh, she released him and walked back to Rosalina, who took her into her arms. Orion waited another moment and then picked up the torch, and walked toward the pyre. He held his hand steady, and his tears at bay, as he set the stack of wood alight. His head turned away, unable to see the first burst of flame as they began to lick over the remains. He could hear the wailing of the women, and the hum of the men keening in the firelight. The sound of their grieving grew, 
to a sound that said they themselves were set ablaze when a geezer of sparks soared into the air. The fire flew and fell and then danced and sputtered for a time. The whole of Kirachu Island seemed to shake with the grief expressed in a thousand hearts. Their energy spent it was not long before the fire conquered their cries and made it a continuous sigh in the background. Had it only been a day earlier that he'd spoken so seriously with his father, listening with his inner ear to those words anew, it was as if Joratan had foreseen his fate. He had told Orion just enough so that he knew where to take his next steps, but not enough to have been able to use the Dissentian blade to try and save him. As his eyes adjusted to the brightness, an image continually played in his imagination. In it he split Galaroth's head in two with that axe. He used this image to distract himself from the other more distressing one, the terrifying task of retrieving Juratan's decapitated head, which was charred to a crisp, blacker than coal, nowhere within the realm of recognition. With this image seared in his thoughts, he silently expressed his pain. I promised that I would not let you go anywhere, father. And now mother is gone too. The mother who was my light when the sun hid its face. The mother who was my rain when the clouds never came. The mother. The mother who never had to wipe my tears away. And never can she be replaced. Rosalina had held Horion close when she told him that with Juratan's death he had become the man of the household. How those words cut him now! Just the day before he had felt very much a man, happy in his growing maturity, happy to breathe the air of this world. But today, today, standing before his father's funeral pyre and smelling the smoke, he had never felt more a child, a helpless boy, heavy with a heart that knew only gloom and doom. If this is what it meant to be a man, he wanted no part of it. Coming close to his sister, he spoke softly. This is it. This is my life. This is our life, Gail. Just when we thought we had the perfect life, this is what happens. The savageness of the situation slithered up Orion's spine, and upon reaching its climax, he raised his eyes to the heavens. And you! he cried out to Lord Trinigan Apocalypse, but his words were bitter. What kind of god are you? You allow evil people to strut the earth like serpents on two legs. And you let the good be slaughtered, when they are the only ones who obey your commandments. He wept hard tears, and shook his head, regretting the times he had not shown his father his love. And I swear, I swear I could have hugged you harder, father. Why didn't I hug harder? Now, now there is literally nothing left to hug. Not even a corpse. And that smell, the smell of your burning flesh, it smelt like scorched swine. I wonder why the flesh of man smells like scorched swine. Nevertheless, the sick stench doesn't die. My nose is its new home. That fizzing as well, it haunts me. That, that fizzing frazzle has called my ears its final abode, and it rings with raw relish. But this is what I do not understand. What sin, what sin did you commit to meet such a fiery fate, Father? What sin? It is so hard to believe that only a few hours ago you were a being with feelings, aspirations, and dreams, but now, now you're nothing but a memory, and you were so beautiful inside and out. Your bodily gestures, your courage, your smile, your laugh, and down to the very way you used to eat, breathe, and sneeze. You were noble, 
and adorable. Orion thought of his father's humour. He was hilarious as well, and not your typical dissentient father. To compliment his characteristics, I have to say that he was more than hilarious. This man had it all, Arthur. You think I'm funny, well, you don't know what funny is until you meet my father. I mean, every little thing this man used to say and do was funny. Even his mere presence. Yes, even his mere presence was funny. He was so funny and fabulous. Every time I used to see his face or, or remember one of his indelible expressions, I used to say, God is great. God is great. Raw emotions swirled through Orion, buffeting him like wild waves against a jagged shore which made him blaspheme against the Almighty. No! God is not great. God is not great. For if he was great, he would have saved my father from such a fiery fate. Orion began to cry again, not just for what was lost in reality, but that which was lost in potential. And father, I guess, I guess you won't be a grandfather after all. That was your dream, wasn't it? And do you know what my dream was? My dream was for you to brew a banquet in a king's cauldron and feed the entire village in merriment for its newest member. That was my bloody dream. For father and son to down a dozen spirits after the wedding and then tell timeless tales around the family fire. And that was the only thing lacking in your life, the only thing that would have made it complete. But you always used to say, you always used to say, Orion, son, whenever you feel gloomy or be ill with a tragedy, never curse the enemy, but raise your hands to the sky with a selfless soul and a wholesome heart, and ask Lord Trinigan Apocalypse for anything. For your own good he may not give you everything, but he will without a doubt give you something. For verily he is the shy. Yes, Gail, God is the shy. He is so shy that he will not let your hands hit your knees empty. So come on, everybody. What are you waiting for? Raise your hands. Raise your hands to the sky and sincerely supplicate. And today, today, Lord Trinigan Apocalypse, today you will not get away. Crown and trophy of the timeless kingdom you are, but you will not get away. You will have to answer this prayer, for we are ready to measure your mercy by raising our hands and beseech before you. Let's see how merciful you truly are. Please, perform what you never performed. Please, give my father back. Take my life instead. Well, no, but you understand. And why do the good die young? They should live long so that they can exalt you as much as they can. So please give him back. But if you will not, if you will not, then at least seal this scar. Fill this void. Fill this gaping hole in my heart. Fill it by guiding me and adjoining justice, for you are the Duke of Justice. Then... Imagining Juratan looking down on him, as well as the villagers, Orion suddenly stopped beating his chest, becoming embarrassed by his self-pity. He licked his lips, and upon tasting his father's dried blood, his heart was set aflame. This time lava literally coursed through his veins, or so he thought, as he neighed. No! His tone turned from tearful to tyrannical. His head came up like the head of a hound, scenting prey. Wiping his tears, he jolted up. The sky was scarred by a blazing branch of light as he faced Rosalina and Gale. And when the wail of the water-wealthy clouds came, rain roared down as he waved and pointed the torch randomly at the villagers and proclaimed, I will not let my spirit break down like this, and let that vindictive villain be victorious. 
I am my father's son. He sent me away to make sure I was prepared to be a paladin and remember Arthur. I said, all is lost, all is smithereens. Well, what I forgot to say, no. What I meant to say was, all is lost, all is smithereens, but a new life will blossom to carry out his father's dreams. And that new life, that new life will be me. I will restore the sword and use it to slay that scum, Galaroth, who will feel the worst of my wrath. Do you hear me? You son of a snake, your shadow has fallen on the wrong light, and you will pay dearly for your evil. Little do you know that this mere being, this little lion, Orion, has the key to the gates of hell, or will soon enough go to the ends of the earth to obtain that key, and he will let nothing on his way stop him from opening the doors of the underworld and unleashing her unimaginable fires to engulf your world. I will make you pay for calling my baby brother Marlon a swine. I will make you pay for every hair that you dishonoured from my mother's head. I will make you pay for every drop of my father's blood that stained, no, graced this ground. I swear down I will make you pay. If I have to bleed out my last drop of blood, I will. If I have to walk through the wall of a waterfall, I will. If I have to run against the current of a roaring river, I will. If I have to scale a lava-veiled volcano, I will. If I have to stop an avalanche in its tracks, I will. If I have to flatten the dunes of the deserts of Galeria, I will. If I have to close the cavernous mouth of the colossal canyon, I will. If I have to peck the peak, split in two or literally lift mighty Mount Apocalypse and then smash it into oblivion, I will. And if I have to touch, yes, if I have to touch the bowels of the Pangean Ocean, I will. And if I have to die, yes, if I have to dive into the jaws of death itself, I will take you with me, Galeron! As long as I have breath in my body, I will swear it on my father's pyre and on my mother's name that I will make you dig your own grave, your own bloody grave, Galeron! And what a fitting punishment! What a fitting punishment for underestimating the blood coursing through my veins. Never judge a sword by its sheath, and start counting your days. For nothing is more dangerous than fighting a foe that has nothing to lose, you knave. So blow your belly with blood, and smoke the smoke you smoke till your throat's the colour of coal, and get ready. Get ready ready to say goodbye as well as lust for light and pay for your atrocity and animosity in full recompense. How sweet my retribution will be. <laughs> <laughs>